First of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to Hemet Unified School District's first State of the District. I will invite up our West Valley Junior ROTC. And ladies and gentlemen, please stand, if you are able, for the presentation of the colors by West Valley's Navy Junior ROTC Color Guard and remain standing for the pledge or salute. Parade the colors. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. to our Navy Junior ROTC. But again, this is our first State of the District, uh, and we want to kick this off with a, a video about Hemet Unified District so you kind of get a sense of who we are, and then after that, I will introduce our board president.
And now, thank you, thank you so much. And now I'd like to invite our board president, Mr. Vic Scavarda, to the podium to say a few words. He did say a few words. I'll do that. Morning, everyone. On behalf of the Governing Board, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the State of the District and to make a few remarks. As many of you know, I started working for him at Unified School District in the fall of 1979 as a traveling music teacher. I drove a 1968 VW Squareback with a drum set in the back, clashing cymbals the whole time, every time I went over a bump to the outlying schools, Idlewild, Cottonwood, and Hamilton Elementary. I taught on the hill for 33 years. I had three kids go through Idlewild School and Hemet High. It went by very quickly. As you can imagine, I've witnessed a lot of district history during that time, and there have been good years, and some that I would rather not talk about. We all have our war stories. I have noticed, as you have also, some recent changes that are heartening. There's a willingness to listen to each other, and there's an environment where your opinion matters and is taken seriously. We are not afraid to seriously examine what we are doing as educators, and education is our goal, no matter what our job is. And we are willing to implement changes if it appears that we are not as effective as we might be. There's a renewed emphasis on building relationships between stakeholders, teachers, and different parts of the organization that help us to understand what happens there and how we can work together more efficiently. We're trying to know the person behind the job because ultimately that person is what really matters. Is everything perfect? Of course not. But I think we're on the right path. When the board was interviewing candidates for the superintendent position over a year ago, I had the opportunity to speak with a gentleman from a neighboring district. And he made this observation. He said, we don't always see eye to eye, but we know that when it's over, we're still friends. And it's on the strength of those relationships that we can make great things happen in this district for our kids. We believe that the education of our students is too important to do anything less. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Christy Barrett. Thank you, Vic. I would like to take a moment to introduce the board members that are here this morning. They are a tremendous support to me personally and, and to the work that we do in our district. So, you just had the opportunity to meet our, our board president, Vic Scavarda. Thank you, Vic. We have Megan Haley here with us this morning. As well as Stacy Bailey. And Patrick Searle. Welcome you all here this morning. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here. There's a vast group here in terms of the stakeholders that we've invited and the involvement that you have here in the community. Some of us are parents, educators, teachers, business leaders, people who simply care about the work that we do and it represents the collective effort that we as a community uh, need to do in order to improve not only the work that we do on behalf of students but the community as a whole. So thank you for taking the time because our vision here in Hemet Unified is that we are part of the bigger whole. We do not exist in, a, in and of ourselves. We exist as something much bigger. And you here today in the room represent that. So thank you so much for being here. So today we have uh, three different things that we would like to accomplish with you. One is to give you a broad stroke in terms of the context and the landscape as it relates to education in our nation, as well as here in the state of California, and how that relates to the work that we're doing here in Hemet Unified. And that will be my role this morning. From there, I will transition to our Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services, Tracy Chambers. And Tracy will be sharing with you the work that we are doing on behalf of our students day in and day out here in Hemet Unified. 
And then last, and truly to me the most exciting part of the day, is our director, um, Dr. Alex Ballard, will be leading you through an activity for us to receive your input so that way we can see your perspective um, across the community in terms of the work that you believe that we should be doing here in Hemet Unified. So I don't know about you, but I do know that when I speak to people who are not formally in education, we like to acronym people to death, right? <laughs> education has never met an acronym that, that we do not like. And so with that, I'm, I'm going to try to make sure that I'm hitting um, all of the acronyms in terms of what they mean, so that way hopefully we all have a shared understanding. Today's landscape has changed greatly. Um, some of you may be familiar with No Child Left Behind. And during that movement, there was very much um, action being taken at the national and state level to centralize the work of education. And the reason for that is it was identified that our students here in, in the United States and our nation, that there, that there was a desired need to improve student outcomes across the nation and for all students. And what was significant about NCLB is that it made us look at student groups in a way that we had never looked at them before. Rather than clumping students together, we really had to begin to take a look at individual students and how we were performing. Now that NCLB has passed, um, we are now today working under the, the guise of ESSA, or the Every Student Succeeds Act. And truly, the primary, the primary difference between that and NCLB is that there's been a shift of the centralization of education to a, more, to a more decentralized effort. And so that states, California, of course, being one, um, has more autonomy in deciding how the accountability and student outcomes look specific to the needs here within our region. In California, one of the very large transitions that have been made is this notion of subsidiarity and local control funding. Sometimes there's this perception that we've received more dollars in education, and that is not factual. What has happened is there's been a reallocation of those dollars because we've identified that some students do in fact need more. And so under the LCFF, or local control funding formula, the way that the allocation of dollars is now distributed amongst school districts is based upon the need and the demographics of the district. There are three target um, student groups that help um, make those determinations, and specifically it's foster youth, students from low-income families, and our English language learners. And so we are very much focused now on equity versus equality, and that's a fundamental shift not only in the state, but in the work that all school districts do, including that here in Hemet Unified. With that, a key piece of the accountability, if you will, is the Local Control Accountability Plan, or we call it LCAP, because we love acronyms. And so with the LCAP, that is the formalized plan where we as a district, there's a lot of internal mechanism and discussions that happen but essentially, it's the place where we show and formalize and document the efforts that we are taking as a district to meet the needs of the student groups, along with all students um, here in, in our organization and in our district uh, that I had mentioned to you previously. And then I would say the third layer of this is how we're being measured. You know, um, back in the day, and I'm sure that some of you have heard this before, um, and even in the real estate market, we were all looking for the schools that were over 800. That was the magical number. And we worked very, very diligently to meet that number. And as educators, we had a lot of tricks up our sleeves because we understood what NCLB was about and we were going to find a way to make it happen. With that, we understand that our students are more than a single number. We also understand that people meaning our students and districts are all starting in a variety of places. The old AYP and API, it did not take into consideration the growth that we had. It made this assumption or expectation that we are, no matter where you are, you will all land in the very exact same, same place at the exact same time. And we know that that's not what's good for kids. And so this fundamental change in the new accountability system recognizes how important acknowledging growth is. We are no longer determined or defined by a single number. 
we now have a variety of indicators that show the success that we have as a district, as well as the success of every child within the organization that we serve. I think one other unique point to put out is I think it's reflective in terms of the expectations that are now placed in public education. Right? It's no longer just about the academics, no longer about reading, writing, and math. We really have a moral, we, we do, we have a moral imperative to serve the whole child. And as a result of that, it's not just the academics, it's also the social, emotional, and the climate pieces that matter. And the new accountability uh, system here in California is indicative of that. So that gives a little bit of context. Um, one of the conversations that we have here in Hemet Unified on a regular basis is defining our why. Why do we do what we do? Um, every time we make a strategic decision or take an intentional action, we ask ourselves why. Why is it that we're doing that? And so defining our why in terms of the role of public education, your why is going to vary depending on the seat that you sit in and the experiences that you have had as an individual. So there's a lot of debate over the why of public education. Some see it as the way to sustain, sustain democracy, right? It, it's how we continue to put forward the American dream, if you will, here in the United States. Some see education as a way to offer social mobility. It's how we improve ourselves. And some see it as social equality. And truthfully, maybe it's all of it. And depending on your seat, it may be that you see it as a blend of all three. I would also say that our personal stories shape our perspective of what public education is. And unfortunately, we don't have enough time here today for us to each share our personal stories. But I will tell you that for me, for me, um, it wasn't the stellar math lesson or that novel that I read that made a difference. It was a specific educator who took a vested interest in me that truly changed my trajectory in life. And it's those types of personal stories that really, in my mind, paint what public education is about. We are uniquely positioned to give every child hope and what they need to be successful in life and to break the cycle that many of our children are in. There's this assumption that people don't want something different. I, I would argue that sometimes we just don't know any different. And so as educators, we are very blessed to be able to give experiences that maybe others would not be able to provide. So with that, we would be in denial to say there weren't also internal and external accountability pieces. That defines our why in part. We understand that there's an expectation to be successful. And lastly, um, for me personally, and I think for, for most here in the room, if not all, we have a, a moral imperative, and I've mentioned that briefly. We have a responsibility to change the narrative around public education. And the narrative or the story around public education has, has been one that's been exist in existence for a long time. So I'm going to share a little bit of what the narrative has been. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents and tyrannize their teachers. Socrates, fifth century BC, right? Narrative has been in place for a long time. Pupils entering high school cannot write well. Their thoughts are immature, they are miserably expressed, and they do not know how to spell. <coughs> Special Committee Report, Harvard University, 1894. We need to restore the ethics of the World War II generation and give youth a sense of obligation to our future. Governor Gray Davis, 1999. Teens bring nothing to the table but a misguided sense of entitlement, minimal skills, and a poor work ethic. I think we have a lot of students here today who would disagree with that. <laughs> Time Magazine, February 1st, 2010. So here in Hemet Unified, we're changing the narrative. 
And this year, and this will be the work that we can continue to do, we have grounded our work around two very fundamental important questions. And our staff across the organization have been made aware of these two questions and it's what we continue to reflect upon as a leadership team. The first is what are we as a district doing to take risk to improve outcomes for each student we serve? We're changing the narrative to equity from equality. We in education, and it's not to speak poorly of educators, it's just what was, is we wanna make sure that everyone has the same, right? If we do one thing at one school, we wanna do that at the other. And the reality is, is our students don't all need the same. And so it means that as educators, we are charged with taking the risk on behalf of our kids. And it's not always the most popular decision, but what are we doing to ensure equity? And that means that for some, it's going to be different. And as the adults, we need to support that and to be okay with that. And then also along this line, and I've said this now a few times, but it is our moral imperative to meet the need of every child. From those that are the most gifted, either it be in academics or in sports or in the visual and performing arts, to the student who has special needs, we have an obligation to every child. And the second question that we're forming our work around is that is Hemet Unified the premier choice or the default system of education for our families? This is a, a hard question to have to face. Are we here because people don't have anywhere else to go? Or are people coming here because this is where they wanna be? And it's the latter that we're striving for in Hemet Unified. We want to make sure that what we offer to our students is such at an exceptional level that they don't want to be anywhere else. And it's because that's what our kids deserve. And I would also say that we would be um, putting our heads in the sand a little bit if we did not acknowledge that we're in a very competitive marketplace today, right? Just as with Southwest Airlines, we can choose others to fly on. Um, we can also choose to take our children elsewhere. And we have to be mindful of that. So with that, we're charged with breaking the mold, changing the narrative. Just to give you a little bit more context, I know that some of this was in the video, but we serve um, our students with low income, 78.2%. 14.6% of our students um, are with special needs. 13.3% are English learners. And 228 of our children are currently foster youth. And this last number, it's a, it's, it's a hard one to swallow, right? Not that any of these statistics would be what we want for our children, but 1,199 of our students as of today are homeless, right? And so when they come through our doors, some of our students, it's just about basic survival, and we as the adults need to be um, aware of that and to take that into consideration in terms of their experience in school. So with that, we have a very special guest here today and I'm going to introduce him um, after the video shows. But this is a young man who is absolutely exemplifying what it means to change the narrative. He exemplifies the importance of the work, not only that we do here in Hemet Unified, but that education offers across the nation. And so with that, it is my pleasure to show a video um, of Joseph Priest, one of our students over at Talkwitz High School. So my mom has six kids, me plus four boys, and the four boys, they always, they weren't good at all. Um, middle school, they were locked up. High school, they were locked up. They were expelled. They were, the house was always getting raided. It was just not good, yeah. And I just seemed like, I was basically following the footsteps for it. Starting eighth grade, I started missing school. Always got referrals, suspensions, um, lots of parent meetings, and always ditched class. I basically failed my whole eighth grade, seventh grade, some of seventh, no, seventh grade, I had A's, and then I met some people and just messed up. And then going into my freshman year, I did good for a little bit, and then I just straight F's. I had nothing higher than an F, not even PE. I didn't have like a stable home. I was always in my dad's house, my sister's house, my uncle's house, and then my mom's house. And the cars were always messed up. Uh, my brothers always take the cars. Um, 
And then my sister, she'll buy me a bus pass, but the bus pass, I didn't know for, like, really how they ran. And I live like over here and the school is way over there. So I had to catch a city bus and I'll get to school around maybe third period, second, the end of sec second period. So those two classes were the reason why I was like, I was filming because transportation. And then the rest, it was just, I seen I was filming those. So I was like, man, I'm just gonna just do what my brothers did. Cause it's, it's just, I was basically trying to just drop out of school, but I never told my family that. Seeing my godmom cry made me realize that I needed to change because I, I, I knew I failed her. She felt like she failed as being a parent. Well, she was she been there my whole life, but she really took like my mom's place. My sophomore year, that's when I, my mom moved, and so I was with her the whole time. So she probably felt like all that time it was her fault, but it wasn't her fault. It was my fault. And yeah, from there on, I told her that I'm gonna start doing good. Um, Hemi School District helped me because in San Bernardino, there's there's like little continuations and all that, but. All my brothers been through it, my cousins been through it, and it would not help, nothing, nothing that San Bruno would do what Alessandro did for me. The support that I got from my teachers and principal and the staff at the school, it made me change, it, it'll make someone change because they'll like the good feedback instead of someone just instantly just judging them because how they look. Cause like me, people won't think that I'm a good student or anything. I was never a happy person. I always faked a smile, but I didn't mean it. And lots of people knew that. And now I'm like more positive. I like how they say they're proud of me. They say like they want me to do better than them. And what makes me proud is that I'm proving people wrong. My advice to students when they start the freshman year, do good, do not mess up. It is not easy. It's easy if you miss like 10 credits, but you, you see you missing those 10 credits, you're like, oh, okay, I missed another 10 credits. And it all adds up, it is not easy. And if you're there like, you feel like you can't do it, just, just do it, prove people wrong. There's ways. Joseph, it's individuals such as yourself that give us purpose every day. And we're very proud of you, and you're truly a role, models to, a role model to others. Please stand and be recognized. Along with your godmother. I am very pleased to transition to our Assistant Superintendent of Education Services, Tracy Chambers. <laughs> Christy shared that we have a group of students that come to us with very um, unique needs. And us as an organization have had to work very hard in addressing the needs for all of our students. It's our goal that every single one of them is successful regardless of the circumstances that they bring to us. And as Christy mentioned earlier, some of us have different perspectives on the purpose of education. And for a long time, meeting the needs of our students behaviorally, socially, food, those things were not things that we typically had to deal with. But us as a district has had to shift and change and adapt so that when all kids come through our doors, we are doing all that we can to help them be successful. Some examples of that you'll see listed here. But we know we have many students that are homeless, many students that come hungry, many students that come with credit deficiencies. And it is our commitment as an org organization to make sure that we are doing whatever we can to address those needs. We have had to adapt, we have had to be creative, we have put into place a various coordination of services to meet every individual student where they're at. So if that means we need to get a backpack, if that means that there's a rough neighborhood that we have to add a bus route, we are doing all that we can to ensure that every student is successful. 
Additionally, we're very excited. If you haven't been there, that's your one homework assignment today. It's to go to our Parent Resource Center. We recognize as a district in order for a, a child's education to be maximized, that relationship with the parent is critical. And so our Parent Resource Center, we have put into place this year. It opened in September. And we are offering a variety of services, um, including classes, training, resources, all so that we can connect with parents and help them to feel empowered in helping their child be successful. Preschool is another one of those investments that we continue to make in Hemet Unified. We know that when our little ones go to preschool, they are academically, socially, and emotionally more prepared when they transition into kindergarten. And it is a priority for us to continue to invest in our itty bitties to make sure that that transition is smooth. And we will continue to invest in preschool in the future. Christy mentioned acronyms. I don't know who came up with this one. It's called BAR. It sounds a lot more fun than it really is. <laughs> it is fun. It really is fun. We also recognize for our ninth grade students that that's a critical year. That is often the year that's going to determine whether or not I'm going to stay in high school or I'm going to drop out. And so we've invested heavily in a pro program called BAR, Building Assets, Reducing Risks where we are investing in our ninth graders through academic, emotional, social, behavioral, family supports. Many of our kiddos are coming to us with complex lives, with trauma, with poverty, and we want them successful. They are going to go on and be contributing members or members of our community. And what we want to make sure is that they are contributing. And how we do that is making sure that we are investing in who they are, investing in their family. We have marriage and family therapists. We have a variety of resources that we are pouring in to our ninth graders, knowing that that is such a critical year. All that to say, I've talked a lot about what we're doing to meet the needs of all kids. Because we here in Hemet Unified have a college and career focus. And many of you are in the business world, and you recognize the game has changed. We are preparing kids for futures and for jobs that don't exist. Don't judge me. I went to McDonald's the other day. I go there a lot. I have twins. I don't have time to cook. <laughs> but I went into McDonald's, and I didn't have to talk to a person. I just got to press a little cute little kiosk, and, and there you go. The game is changing. So we have to position ourselves in Hemet Unified where we are setting up opportunities for all of our kids to go to college. And we're doing that in a variety of formats. First, I'd like you, uh, I'm actually going to read this to you, so move around a little bit. If we don't put the idea of college on the table early, the likelihood that kids are going to go to college is very low. It has to be a part of their dream. You have to ingrain it in their plan for the future. You have to excite and motivate them. And we can do that, and we need to do that. And so you will constantly hear, starting, I mentioned our babies in preschool. Starting there, we are looking at ways that we are communicating and investing in who they are, that that is the path for all kids. I'll give you just a quick second to look at that graphic. Christy talked about changing the narrative. And again, we recognize the future of jobs are changing radically. And what we know today will often be obsolete a few years from now. And so we are investing heavily here in Hemet, Feud on, Hemet Unified on how do we flip that? How do we support that notion of college and career readiness? And so you'll see that we are investing significantly in teacher training. And as a former teacher, I can say part of the shift includes unlearning some of the things that we have previously learned and thinking about how do we reach our kids where they're at, how do we keep up with the fast pace of technology, how do we keep up with automation. And so we in Hemet Unified are very, very proud. We have invest a lot in professional development for our teaching staff, for our administrators, to support the work of the future. We recognize that what we do now is going to impact generations. 
And so thinking forward, thinking about how, how do we adapt, how do we mold. So you'll see some pictures here. We have techno trainer, trainers and NGSS and a whole bunch of other acronyms that I don't have time to go into today. But we are taking a significant step backwards to say what do we need to provide to our teachers so that they are leading that work for all of their kids in their classrooms. I talked a little bit about that world is changing. There have been a lot of studies, I'm sure many of you have seen in Forbes ma magazine, and we've talked to the military, we've talked to white collar, blue collar, different professions. People are hiring and looking for skills that transcend content. So to be a 21st century learner, we want our kids to be able to think critically, to be creative, to communicate effectively, and to collaborate. So we are investing a lot in developing our teachers and developing our leaders and developing our students. And how can we integrate those skills into all that we do? Because we don't know what the jobs are going to be in 10 years, but we do know that organizations and employers are looking for those skill sets. I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about some different programs that we put in place to support that notion of college and career for all. But before I talk about those programs, I want to make one clear distinction. The programs are not where the magic is at. It's the educator that is in the room every day. And the relationships they have with the kids is critical. And so we're going to talk about some great programs that help us as educators change our pedagogy and help us think differently and help us refine our skills and unlearn and relearn but these programs are not the end-all be-all. It's that person in the room making a difference with those kids every day. So with that, we talked about starting when they're little. It's our obligation to ensure that they know about college. That from, from the time they're in elementary school, we have a program called Crayons to College. There are lessons where kids are learning about the opportunities. They're learning about thinking in that perspective of, I can be somebody. I'm going to be somebody. And there are things I can do now as a little one to prepare myself for that. Many of you are also familiar with AVID. AVID in the past typically had been a secondary program and was designed for students that did not have family that had attended. They were first time college attenders. We've invested heavily in bringing that all the way down to our elementary kids. I was in a kindergarten class just last week at one of our school sites. And a little boy put his little binder away on the little shelf and said, I'm an AVID student. AVID students are organized. <laughs> yeah. I'm working on that with my twins. They're not there yet. <laughs> so we continue to look at what are opportunities that we can bring in to build that culture. Another program that we're incredibly proud of is our dual language immersion. We started that at Hemet Elementary School. And that is an, a, a program where by the end of the program, students are going to leave bilingual. And so we know, again, college and career, we know that that is going to set our kids apart. Their ability to go out into the world and to get jobs solely based on the fact that they are literate in more than one language is critical. So we've started small. We started at Hemet Elementary School, but we're looking at expanding that and also growing that in our middle schools and our high schools. And again, it's all with this mindset, college and career for all. What can we do as a district to provide opportunities for all of our children, depending on their different levels and different interests? Another program, again, it's not about the program, it's about the person, but this program is called Project Lead the Way, known as PLTW. Many of you in this room know that the future of many careers is in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Again, so us being reflective. What can we do as an organization to put programs, to put opportunities in place for all of our kids so that when they leave us, they make our community better? They provide jobs. They provide opportunities. They continue the cycle. And so you'll see here we've started this again in elementary school. And it is, as a fourth grader, I can know and I can have exposure and opportunity to STEM. In middle school, I can learn a little bit more about it. And the time I'm in high school, I can say, that path is for me. 
And this is going to give me a step as I leave high school, a pathway on to a career which is an edge against other students that are competing in the same fields. So we're very, very proud of the work that we've done with Project Lead the Way. Uh, I'd also like to talk about CTE. Those are our career technical education programs. Many of us in the room might have known those as vocational ed. Anybody? I know I've been talking at you a long time. You with me? Voc ed we've heard about? Okay. CTE, again, is another significant investment that we've made as a district. Uh, voc ed in the past um, often did not necessarily have that college pathway connected to it. So what we do with our CTE courses, again, is we're taking a look. We're taking a look at what are the needs in the community? What are the needs in terms of the job market? How can we put our kids into pathways that are going to lead them to increased opportunity and to increased success? Uh, you saw in some of the video, we've got uh, the auto uh, shop program, which is amazing. Again, if you have an opportunity to see that at Hemet High. We just have spectacular CTE programs, again, thinking about what can we do as an organization to provide more opportunities for our kids. This number <coughs> blows me away. Um, as a district, we chose to invest in paying for our students to take the SAT and SAT, the PSAT, excuse me. And the reason we did that was again, if we are saying college and career for all, we have to recognize that the finances of taking that test was a barrier for some kids. So you see in 2015, PSAT, 464 students took it, SAT, 268. And you see in 2016 and 2017, the investment that we've made not only in this, but look at the opportunity that now so many more children will have as a result of us taking that on. So the barrier of accessing that test has been removed. And again, thinking about what can we do? What can we shift as an organization? And we're very, very proud of that statistic. We are also very proud of our extracurricular activities here in Hemet. We recognize, and we spoke earlier, it's about the whole child. So what can we do to engage our kids in school? For me personally, it was sports. That's why I went to school every day. I know you wouldn't know it now, but yeah, I was. I could jump above the net a long time ago. So we're thinking about how can we increase our athletic programs? How can we increase our uh, visual and performing arts? How can we increase our clubs? How can we get kids connected? We know that when you have trouble at home or you're in poverty or you have issues, that feeling of belonging or that feeling of connectedness might just be the thing that gets you in the door. I loved when Joseph said he was on the football team, right? Those are your buds, that, 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 those are your teammates. And so we continue to invest heavily in those programs. Additionally, we have other ways to connect kids. Uh, our Western Center robotics team, I think they're world champions. I don't know if that's such a thing, but we have lots of different opportunities where we're connecting kids with um, mock trial, with different clubs, different organizations. We're really mindful of what's going to be the thing that might connect for that student. And how can we connect them to that? So once we get them in the door, we can work with them. We just have to make sure we keep them there. So I'm going to close with just a few of our highlights. Again, we have all of our principals in the room today. They have lots of positive stories, lots of accolades to share. I just wanted to highlight a few of them. Um, Hemet is very proud of the academic decathlon. For the past 18 years, we are the winner winners. So this is the, if you've ever, attended um, one of the competitions, it is a humbling experience. These kids are amazing. And so to see that we continue to set the bar high, we are competitive, we are dominating. The seal of multiliteracy, again, this is a very um, prestigious uh, accomplishment for our kids to be able to exit high school with this uh, additional awards stating that they are proficient in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Again, this is exit assessment or interview process is intense. 
and we are very impressed and we continue to grow the number of kids that are receiving this war award. And finally, all kids, college and career. Last year, we had our seniors were awarded more than five million dollars in grants and scholarships. And that number we want to continue to see rise. So we want to celebrate the work that we're doing, but we recognize when we say all, we have not arrived. We still have work to do. And although graduation might look like the culminating activity, it's bigger than that. This is our community. We want it to flourish. We want it to be the best. And so in just a few minutes, uh, Dr. Alex Ballard is going to take over because we want to hear from you. You are invested in our community. You are on our streets every day. You see our school. Some of you have kids in our school. We want to be the premier choice. And in order to do that, we need your input. Thank you all once again for coming. We know that your time is precious and valuable. And I'm very warmed and excited about the commitment that come across today in your comments as it relates to the support that is wanted um, between the district and community. I will share with you that your input today will be taken to heart and action will be taken as a result of it. As Alex had mentioned earlier, the Start Stop Continue activity was done with every employee in the organization and we have countless numbers of examples of where that input has now been used to create change that we have implemented this year. And the input that you've provided us will be no different. You offer a critical perspective that sometimes when you're only in these four walls, you don't get the opportunity to experience. So thank you again. We very much look forward to future opportunities with you. And I will tell you as the superintendent of Hemet Unified and also from the Board of Education, we value the relationship of everyone that's in this room as well as those that you represent. Thank you very much for being here, and we hope that you have a safe and blessed day. Thank you.